The Daily Rios Digest, July 25th, 2021. Movie Monday. This was going to be a Musical Monday segment, but that's the beauty of recording daily. Sometimes your plans change as the day goes on. For instance, I dropped on Twitter today something I hadn't planned on talking about and got a little reaction to it. So I thought, okay, maybe, maybe I will talk about it. It's concerning the movie Birds of Prey and the Fantabulous Emancipation of One Harley Quinn. This has been on HBO Max for a while, and because the new Suicide Squad movie is on its way in a week or so, I decided to go back, as I always do, and rewatch the first Squad movie and then watch for the first time Birds of Prey. And then I posted on Twitter. It took about four to five different days, different sittings, to watch the movie all the way through, and I figured that was enough of a review for people to infer what my thoughts are uh, on the movie, you know. I would watch up to a point and then think, okay, I have other things I could be doing. And then I'd come back another day, try again from where I left off, same thing. Maybe I was bored or uh, felt like I just had seen enough for that day, so on and so on, until I finished it. After getting a few comments on Twitter about my reaction, I thought, all right, let's, let's talk about this Daily Rio style. First off, I am biased with this movie for two reasons. First reason, I'm not the target for characters like Harley Quinn or Deadpool. I get their popularity. I really do. For me, I think they work best in a group setting or sparingly not as the main stars of whatever, a movie or comic. Now, someone might be saying, Peter, one of your favorite characters, characters is Ambush Bug. Yeah, you're right. I do love gesture characters if they're written well and if their humor isn't forced. And, you know, I, I like when they break the fourth wall. But I don't need that for 90 minutes or, or 23 pages worth in a comic. For me, Deadpool was funny and different in those early X-Force years and in his two first miniseries. And I really liked how he was used in Remender's Uncanny X-Force. Once writers decide to always write him like that in every comic, every panel... Once writers decide, I can show how funny I am through Deadpool's dialogue, that's it. Then it's over for me, you know. It's why I still haven't seen his movies. I think, I've, I, think I saw maybe half of his first movie. Um, you know, when they are given the role of narrator on top of their usual antics for a long stretch and not sparingly, I'm out, you know. Um... Harley Quinn, honestly, I think Heroes in Crisis was the longest Harley Quinn story I've ever read. And you couple all of that with, you know, all of what I just talked about with the fact, and here's the second reason, with the fact that this movie was the movie that my ex decided to go see around Valentine's Day last year uh, after, we, after our breakup with her new friend <laughs> friend yeah so this movie has a target on it absolutely i get that i went in with low expectations once i got the vibe of the movie from the first you know few minutes i think it was just downhill from there poor dialogue margot robbie's attempt at the harley voice wasn't working for me this in this movie ewan mcgregor as black mask thinking and acting like he's in a Joel Schumacher Batman movie, Cassandra Kane in name only, Mary Elizabeth Winstead, who I love, but 
having her role written in, I don't know, such a cardboard way, even dumb nitpicky things like Harley gets a, a, a hyena and the damn thing doesn't even do anything. It doesn't, he doesn't do anything the whole movie. So you couple all that, you put all that together and I, I think I was out. You know, maybe the last part of this movie that I watched when they actually kind of all get together and do the big fight. All right, now, now I was kind of there, but there wasn't a lot of dialogue during that part, right? So there's a reason probably why I liked it. Now, the two that I really enjoyed, mostly because I believe uh, they're acting and mostly because I feel like they, they have some weight in the movie, not necessarily because I felt that they were maybe right for their roles, were Rosie, Rosie Perez and uh, especially Journey Smollett-Bell. With Rosie, she had a rawness that I liked. Uh, she, she, she's an established actor. She's going to fill her, her role with stuff, with weight, with experience, whatever. Is she Renee Montoya? I mean, maybe a later in life version, sure. I see what they're trying to go for, but I don't know. I mean, I did like the brawler in her and the fighting style for most of the characters and, and the stunt doubles was really good. Now, with Journey's Black Canary, this was my first time watching Journey in a movie and, you know, I'm a big Black Canary fan. This was going to be a hard sell for me. It's the New 52 version with the singer background, but she felt real. She felt grounded. She felt like she was in this universe. She was all legs when she fought. And uh, I think she, uh, uh, the actor and the stunt double, they were amazing to watch during the stunt sequences because it felt the most connected. You know, when, when you watch fight choreography and when you can see the choreography, but it doesn't look like anything is really connecting or landing or the impacts aren't selling, then it just doesn't read, you know. But I felt like with what was going on with Journey and Black Canary, okay, things were connecting. It reminded me a little bit of, I don't mean the choreography, but just this feeling reminded me of the Punisher Daredevil rooftop fight uh, on the Netflix Daredevil show because it felt like it was raw and real, like somebody was walking out of there with, with some major bruises. And then, of course, you have Black Canary's power finally being shown later in the movie. You know, they saved that for a special moment. It's more or less what you expected. I even went on a little bit of a tangent and looked at a couple ways that they uh, show Black Canary's canary cry, whether it's in animation or TV, now in the movies. I don't know. I'm not sure the sound of what they use for her powers and all of those different aspects and all those different uh, mediums. I don't know if any one of them has really hit yet what I thought I was hearing in the comics. But honestly, I don't even know what I was hearing. So um, Harley Quinn's fighting style was really good. I wanted her to be even more acrobatic, but I did like the spontaneity. It was very different from watching the first Squad movie when she really is all just about slamming the, that bat around. Ultimately, the plot of this movie, the constant flashbacks, the, narr the narr narration, the, the, the tone of it, the jokes kind of all fell flat. I was not a fan. If you liked it, great. I doubt I'll need to see it again. Um, but I am looking forward to uh, the next Suicide Squad movie because I really enjoyed the first one. So there you go. My thoughts, Birds of Prey. Hello, Paul. Hello. I am Dr. Herfi Stafner. Come in, come in, please. Take a seat. Take a seat. What can I do for you today? Uh, just, I just, I'm, I can't sleep. I, I, I can't focus on anything. The only thing I can think about is, like, DC events. DC events? As in the comic books? DC events? Yes, yes. The comic book events. Oh, interesting. Uh, are we we talking things like Crisis on Infinite Earths? Yeah, yeah, totally. That one, yeah. Uh, Infinite Crisis? Yeah, yeah, that one too. Oh, very, very... Invasion, maybe? Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, the, uh, the Genesis? 
Uh, not so much. No? Oh. Okay, well, I think it's really good if you talk about the things that are troubling you in your life. So maybe you should do a podcast about this obsession. What, what, what do you call this obsession? What do you think it is? I think you're a unique case. I've not seen anything like this before in my office. I'm going to suggest that you have what we call DCOCD. What? DCOCD? You are obsessive and compulsive about your DC events. I think you should talk it out, get it out of your system via a podcast. I will help you, my friend. We shall do a podcast together about your DCOCD. Oh, Okay. When I won't even start? charge you for it. <laughs> awesome. I don't think I can claim you on benefits. <clears throat> yeah, it's good. <laughs> when shall we start? Um, I'll get back to you on that. I'll check my I'll check my timetable. <laughs> cool. Trivia Tuesday. Back in the Daily Rios episode 504, which was entitled Year 10 Begins, I was talking about things that I wanted to do uh, for this year. And now that I have, you know, new equipment and the use of Zoom, and one of the things I wanted to do is I want to do a Zoom trivia match or a Zoom trivia game. I talked about how I could make it uh, just a generic question and answer game, or I could focus on particular topics like all X-Men trivia or all Flash trivia, etc., or maybe like all DC Comics trivia. Uh, you know, I got a few responses, just a few, uh, and one of them said, uh, was I guess was just asking generically um, about the questions, etc. So I thought, you know what, let me go and just read uh, some questions. So you can hear the type types of questions that I have in this game. So again, it was initially created around Trivial Pursuit. So there are six topics. Uh, continuity, which is like history, first appearances, family things. Um, uh, you know, basically it's the history category. Uh, geography, which is self-explanatory. Powers and paraphernalia. Think Anything that's like kind of handbook style or costumes, organizations, uh, tech things, things like the animals, things like that. Uh, then events. It could be uh, some of Marvel or DC's larger events, uh, crossover events. It could be story arcs. It could be something in the comic news. Um, things that have like a, a larger feel to them characters or creators that's pretty self-explanatory we're talking like you know first name or, or names of characters um uh, team rosters things like that and then hyper time which is basically your pro potpourri category so i have uh, a stack of dc cards and a stack of marvel cards and uh, normally the way we used to play is every card has those six categories. So you would have to get all, uh, you would have to answer a question for each category in DC and then answer all six categories for a Marvel, for Marvel. Um, and you would go around the Trivial Pursuit board. I mean, initially I didn't have a board. It was just pieces of paper. Um, and then once you got both of those, or all 12 of those questions, I think the other team would then pick uh, one, you'd, you'd have to get like one more bonus question, again, kind of similar to Trivia Pursuit, I guess, uh, And but the other team would pick what category and what company they, they want you to answer from. Um, and then once we got the board, it was obviously a little easier, so... But we've played it many different ways. We've played it on CGS a bunch of times. So somebody, you know, was asking about the questions. I thought, you know what? I'm just gonna I'm just gonna read some questions. So I'm gonna read one from every category, um, and I'll start now with a, a DC card. And actually, I guess I'm jumping around uh, from a bunch of different cards for DC. So here we go. Continuity. According to JLA Year One, a Justice League of America member flew in the U.S. Air Force with a Doom Patrol member. Name them. 
All right, are you thinking about it? All right, and then the obvious answer here, we got Hal Jordan, Green Lantern, flew with Larry Trainer, negative man of the Doom Patrol because they both had similar careers. Geography. George Perez's Wonder Woman initially took place in what American city? And the answer I'm looking there for, uh, for there is Boston, Massachusetts, um, because that's where her base of operations was post-crisis. Powers and paraphernalia. Name the entity that possessed Jesse Custer, granting him the power of the word of God. Now, sometimes vertigo, I try to put in the potpourri category, but I guess there are some other times when, uh, you know, I just need a certain type of question, you know, especially for powers. And this is perfect, right? Name the entity that possessed Jesse Custer. And the answer is Genesis. How you doing so far? That's three. Um, no cheating, no Googling. Let's go to events. In the Long Halloween by Jeff Loeb and Tim Sale, on which holiday... Did the killer holiday not kill? And the answer to that is April Fool's Day. Then we go to character, uh, yeah, characters and creators. Uh, here we go. Which hero's rogues gallery includes Black Bison, Plastique, Killer Frost, and the Weasel? And the answer to that is Firestorm from the 80s. And then finally, Hypertime. Uh, this is a DC card, so it's actually a DC question. Usually it's it can be a mix of anything. It could be a Marvel question, it could be other companies, it could be movies, TV, whatever. Uh, so Hypertime. On the Shazam TV series from the 70s, what was the name of Billy Batson's traveling companion? And the answer is Mentor. I wrote that question. I have it here on the card. I'm looking at it. I probably would have forgotten that somewhere along the way, even though I'm the one who wrote it. So, so there you go. Those are uh, some questions from DC's cards. Let's go to Marvel and see what we have. Starting with continuity, we have which Avenger could be considered to be Vision's grandfather? Now we're talking comics here. And the answer is... Hank Pym, because Hank Pym created Ultron, Ultron created Vision, and uh, he could be considered, Hank Pym could be considered Vision's grandfather. Geography, 13 Seabreeze Crescent, Southampton, Long Island, New York, is the home to which Marvel character? That's a hard one. Yeah, you really have to be a fan of that. So the answer is, that is the address for the Spectre Mansion, Mark Spectre, Moon Knight. Powers and pa paraphernalia. What company does Spider-Man 2099 work for in his civilian identity? And the answer is Alchemax. A lot of times when I write these questions, I'm I'm writing about like their earliest appearances, unless I specify otherwise. Um, or it's the most traditional answer, right? You know, if I say, for instance, what, what color is Superman's cape? You know, Superman at one point might have worn a, a white cape, but I'm not looking for that. I'm looking for like the most traditional answer. So probably I would rewrite this question and say, you know, in Spider-Man 2099's first appearances or first series. Um, but yeah, that is the answer, Alchemix. Events. Now, this is one of my favorite subcategories uh, within a larger category. So it's called head to head. And when you get a head to head, whoever is ask, answering the question, both teams actually answer the question. Or maybe there's, you know, four, four contestants or whatever. Um, usually because it means I'm looking for a list, um, a longer list of answers, such as with this question. Name as many characters possible that Iron Man went after during the first Armor Wars. This is a question that I, I would need to research again just to make sure I'm correct. But the answer I have here, let's see, one, two, three, there's a bunch. There's like at least ten or so. Beetle, Controller, Crimson Dynamo, Firepower, Guardsman, Mandroids, Mauler, Raiders, Stiltman, Stingray, and Titanium Man. 
So you can see that's, <laughs> you got to know your stuff, right? For that kind of question, you got to know that storyline and you got to just think about who's in the Iron Man universe and just write down as many as you can. Whoever comes up with the most answers, they would win that category and then they would win control of the board. Here we go, characters and uh, creators. Donald Pierce, the cyborg, once held what rank within the Hellfire Club? And the answer is White Bishop. And then for Hypertime for Marvel, we have, uh, here we go, some another company. Who created the image series Witworks? And the answer is Wils Portasio. So there you go, just a, a little cross-section of some of the questions. Some of those were, you know, uh, not terribly hard. Um, there's some questions in the game that can be really hard. Uh, a lot of times when we play, when we get to a category, geography is not a favorite, you know, of, of people who play uh, the trivia game. And a lot of times they, they fear that they're going to get a Legion world question. Um, where some people would get that right, other people just have no idea. So there you go. Just a little bit. I thought it kind of would be fun to just show a cross-section of questions. Uh, I'm still finishing up. I'm trying to put them all, all these questions into a spreadsheet. I am about, I, I am almost done. And once I, once I, you know, kind of inspect the questions and f finesse them and come up with some new ones and um, I, I want to play the game. So if you're interested please email me, peter at thedailyrios.com. Let me know what you're interested in. Do you want to do a general matchup? Um, I would love to do some more specific matchups, you know, with, with a company or character or title or creator. Uh, it could be a lot of fun. Or or if you want, want to leave it up to me, I'll do that too. But if you're interested, you want to be a contestant and you're not going to cheat, right? No cheating. No phones, no Google, no no voice activated things you know this is all for fun and bragging rights so don't be a cheater um uh if you want to you want to play let me know hey everybody jace from the comic source here telling you about the charity auction i'm going to be hosting at terrificon if you're not familiar with terrificon it's a great comic centric show that's held every year at the mohegan sun casino in connecticut and this year, Mitch Halleck, the organizer, generously invited me to host my charity auction there. The auction is for a little boy named Titus who's battling leukemia. Uh, he's only two years old and every Friday he's got to go in for chemotherapy treatments. And on top of that, every third visit, he's got to actually have a chemo treatment that's injected directly into his spine to keep the cancer from spreading there. On top of all that, every time he goes in for his uh, therapy, he also has to have his platelets tested in his blood. And if they're not high enough, he has to have a blood transfusion. So as you can imagine, it's a lot for this little guy and his five brothers and sisters and his parents. And we all know how expensive healthcare is in this country. So we have some amazing donations from a lot of creators that wanted to get involved and help out Titus and his family from signed books from Jimmy Palmiotti and Amanda Connor to uh, original art from artists like Adam Gorham. There's even a Nicola Scott original page from her Wonder Woman run. Uh, there are some very, very ultra rare exclusive Valiant items from the Valiant poker games that have been held at San Diego over the years. So there's all kinds of great unique items and we're gonna be adding more right up until the date of the auction, which is August 1st. It takes place at 1 p.m. Eastern time in room B at the Mohegan Sun Casino Convention Center. Uh, so if you're there, you're more than welcome to join us. Like I said, there's gonna be tons of great items to bid on. There's also gonna be giveaways. So even if you don't have anything uh, to bid on or you didn't win anything, there's still a chance you're gonna walk away with something. Uh, we're also going to simultaneously broadcast the auction on YouTube. So if you're not able to uh, attend the convention and you want one of these items, you wanna bid on them, you certainly can join via YouTube and bid that way. So uh, we hope for a big turnout so we can support Titus and his family and just have uh, you know, a big lump of money uh, go into his GoFundMe page. All the money goes directly to Titus's GoFundMe page. I don't touch it. Uh, we want all the money to go to his treatment. So uh, you can go to twitter.com forward slash the comic source. Look at the 
thread that's pinned right at the top. It has all the details. You can check out the auction items there. You can also go to lrmonline.com, the pop culture site that hosts the Comic Source uh, podcast. You can find all the details there on the web page about the rules of the auction and how things are going to be shipped out and whatnot. So uh, again, we really appreciate everybody sharing this on social media. We hope you take the time to join us and check out these awesome comics and original art and other unique one of a kind items that we're going to be auctioning off to help out Titus and his family. So thanks for uh, taking the time to listen to this, everybody. And we'll talk to you next time. New comics Wednesday and reviews. Recommendations for new comics on July 21st. We have Fred Van Lanty and Ryan Dunlavey's Comic Book History of Animation trade out from IDW. This is following their Action Philosophers, Action Presidents, Comic Book History of Comics. It's a lighthearted approach to the history of whatever their focus is, but I always enjoy that. So look out for that. Fifth Quarter by Mike Dawson of Freddy and Me and Troop 142. This is volume one of two about a girl who deals with her insecurities through her love of basketball and her desire to get better at the game. This is a middle grade graphic novel. The Celestia hardcover by Manuel Fior, who also did The Interview and 5,000 Kilometers Per Second. That's from Fanagraphics. Blue and Gold, One of Eight, by Dan Jurgens and Ryan Sook from DC Comics. I hope that's funny. And also from DC Superman and the Authority, One of Four, by Grant Morrison and Mikhail Hanin. It's Grant Morrison, so of course I'm going to pick that up. And then we have uh, Illegal Cargo, the graphic novel, written and il illustrated by uh, Augusto Mora. This is from Black Panel Press, which I'm not sure I've heard of before. Uh, you know, I've heard that company before. They're inspired by European graphic novels. It was founded in 2017, and uh, they're trying to bring indie adventure graphic novels made by creators from all over the world to comics. Augusto Mora is a Mexico City-based comic artist. Illegal Cargo is a 96-page graphic novel inspired by the true stories of everyday migrants on journeys north from Central and South America. Those are the standout recommendations that I saw from the list for uh, this week, on top of other titles that I might be getting, but I like to pick out um, first issues, new works, collections, etc. Also, I wanted to try to do some quick reviews of new books that shipped uh, in the previous week. For this round, I actually picked three titles from the previous two weeks. So I'm going to talk about the first issues of Ordinary Gods from Image Comics, Justice League Infinity 1 of 7 from DC Comics, and Sinister War 1 of 4 from Marvel. I'm not really going to go too deep into all of these. So Ordinary Gods by Kyle Higgins, Philippe Watanabe, uh, Frank William on Colors, Clayton Cowles, Letterer. This is from July 7th. I was interested in this because I like anything to do with a pantheon of gods. This is a story about uh, a backstory where five gods are pulled from their realm and they're trapped into a planet uh, that has been made into a prison, which is Earth. And they're forced into an endless cycle of human death and reincarnation. So then we meet the main character, Christopher. He's 22. He's a black youth. He's got parents, a 12-year-old sister. And he's in therapy. And he's also one of the five. He's also one of the reincarnated gods. Which means in order to save everyone he cares about, Christopher will have to reconnect with his past lives and do the unthinkable, become a god again. That was the the blurb, the log line. Um, it was okay when I read this first issue. I, after I read the first issue, I thought, well, I probably should read a number of issues in a row because if I read issue by issue, I'm not I'm not probably not going to enjoy it as much. I want to see how the whole story lays out. Not that this first issue was light. I mean, there's a lot of backstory in who these gods are and what they do. It feels like there's a lot of world building. I just wish there was a little more attention to characterization. 
maybe even motivation. I mean, there's some of that, but it feels like we got all the backstory and then we're thrown into the present and we're thrown into the situation. Uh, but why did the gods do the things that they did outside of just the trappings of power, etc.? The artwork reminded me of uh, the style of someone like Lionel Francis Yu. This is probably the first Kyle Higgins comic I've read, and it made me think of, you know, the battle between, like, Immortal Man and Vandal Savage. Um, I'm not certain the dialogue really fit well for the main character of Christopher. Uh, you know, I certainly applaud the fact that they're using a black youth in the main role, but... Some of the dialogue felt generic. It didn't feel authentic to a particular city or uh, a particular way that maybe this character talks. It all kind of felt interchangeable. It all, it, it's kind of like that dialogue, uh, let's see, Bendis sort of gets accused of this where everybody is, everybody just has the same style of talking and maybe the same style of humor and some of the references that this character makes Christopher I sort of question I go hmm would really is I mean that just feels kind of generic and feels more like the author voice than it does the character voice now there was one turn of events at near the end of the issue that was kind of unexpected but the outcome of that I I suspected all along it looks good, the cover is good, the story and premise is interesting, execution of the dialogue, not so much, and I wish there was just a little more, a little more weight to the overall story. So, uh, And then I read, as I said, also from July 7th, Justice League Infinity 1 of 7 by J.M. DeMatteis and James Tucker, both of those are the writers, Ethan Beavers on art, Nick Filardi colors, Tom Napolitano on letters, and Francis Manipal on the cover. Beautiful cover, by the way. I actually wish the the cover art reflected more in the uh, in the inside, in the interior pages. It's a story narrated by Martian Manhunter, uh, reflecting a lot of the characterization that uh, John Ostrander and Tom Mandrake created for the Martian Manhunter run in the late '90s, with all the different identities. Uh, this takes place after. Things that have happened with the Justice League Unlimited cartoon. There's callbacks to Amazo. There's callbacks to Darkseid no longer ruling Apocalypse. We get Granny Goodness. We get Calabac in this issue. We get the a birthday celebration with the Flash. And some other characters like Elongated Man, Fire and Ice, Vixen, The Atom, etc. I think it's awfully wordy. I think it's a little overwritten for it to be tied to the animated series. Not that the animated series was light, but this felt almost too overwritten. I've been watching random episodes of Justice League or Justice League United. Uh, if I'm cooking or Justice League Unlimited, if I'm cooking, you know, uh, or whatever, and I just want to watch something really quick. So as I was reading this, I was like, mm, it, the tone of the animated series is certainly captured in the artwork, but I'm not sure it's captured in the style of writing. Maybe in the dialogue, but this really does feel, it almost feels like too much of a tie-in comic rather than, uh, you know, like rather than something like a, a Smallville Season 11 or uh, Buffy the Vampire Season 9, you know. This just feels feels more like a tie-in comic, um, something that would be mass-marketed alongside of a toy or a DVD. I'm sure I'll read the other issues, you know, it's only seven, what, is it, what did I say, seven, seven issues, there, there's going to be an overarching story, but uh, you probably will get a, uh, a complete story within each issue. And then from last week, July 14th, Sinister War, one of four. I don't know why I wanted to read it, but I thought, you know, I always like to check in with the larger Spider-Man events. And this feels like uh, a, a lot of things coming to a head. His battle with Kindred, stuff going on with Doc Ock and Sinister Six, uh, even connections all the way back to One More Day and Mephisto. This is by Nick Spencer, Mark Bagley, 
Hennessy Dell and Owens on inks, Brian Reber's colors, Joe Caramagna letters, Hitch and Mounts on cover. Between Bagley's art, Spencer's writing, the lighter approach to the story, uh, the threat doesn't necessarily feel threatening, even though there is conflict. Even the title logo design, I thought this could be like I was reading Spider-Man in the late 90s or the 2000s. I mean, this is written for, it feels like it's written for younger readers. I mean, everything is all ages if you think about it, but there's a quality to it that makes me think, okay, this is, um, they're not looking to write anything too deep, too dark. They just want it to be entertaining and a, a little generic. <laughs> I don't know if you're someone who's reading this for a long time and you've been waiting for it. I imagine it probably has some... Um, relevance to what's going on. Mysterio is in it. Uh, there's two, there's a Sinister Six and then there's a Savage Six. So yeah, it feels like there's a lot going on. Uh, I don't feel like I missed anything though. I mean, outside of like, okay, the buildup for Kindred maybe and why he's attacking Spider-Man, but it just kind of felt like, okay, this is just another day in the life of Peter Parker where all these villains are ganging up on him. And unless the Doctor Strange Mephisto stuff and the One More Day stuff takes over, because I assume maybe they're either touching on it or maybe they're going to resolve it, but who knows. So yeah, surprisingly, all three of these issues, uh, fine. Not anything I would say go rush out to get. Maybe Ordinary Gods, if if it sounds interesting. I think out of the three, I was most impressed by the artwork on that one. Um, but all of these, I think, uh, unless you want to be in the know with, like, Sinister War, you probably could just wait until all these are collected or until they show up on some app. There you go. That's my review. My name is Brett Scott, and I am the host of Marvel Plus. What's Marvel Plus, you ask? Marvel Plus is a companion podcast for the Disney Plus Marvel series. Each week, a special guest co-host and I will recap, break down, and review the latest episode of the MCU-connected Disney Plus series. And we dig deep. Along with discussing the episode of the week, we explore fan theories, dig into the comic book source material, and speculate on how the current story ties into the bigger picture of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. If you love the MCU, you will love this podcast. Add Marvel Plus to your favorites and get new episodes every Monday. Throwback Thursday. Since we're in year 10 of the Daily Rios, I decided to go back to episode 1, and listen to my own podcast again. Actually, I do that a lot, I have to say. I do listen to um, previous episodes, like for the Legion Project. I, I listen to early episodes um, or episodes that have just come out leading up to whatever our new episode is going to be, mostly because I want to make sure we're following up on topics or ideas um, but also because you never know what you say, you don't remember what you say and you're like, okay, let me go back and listen because maybe there's an idea in there somewhere. And that's exactly what I wanted to do here for this segment was just go back, listen to episode one, see if I could get some ideas for the digest format. And I, even in episode one, I came away with a number of things that I mentioned in that episode that I was like, yeah. I should follow up on them. So uh, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that on one of these segments. I don't know, in a throwback Thursday or follow back, or, you know, follow back Friday or something like that. Or follow up Friday is what I meant to say. So in episode one, here are the topics that I would like to possibly uh, approach um, in the next couple weeks, months, whatever. And I'm probably going to keep doing this with all the episodes. I'm just going to re-listen and see what kind of ideas I get. So first of all, as I was talking about the Daily Rios and the formation of that first episode, 
I, I was talking about solo host podcasts. And the one that I've been listening to probably for the longest is Derek Coward over at Comic Book Noise. And so it made me think I would love to do a chat with Derek Coward. He has invited me on his show uh, at least once, maybe twice. Um, I know he's not a big interview person and that he enjoys his, his single host podcasting. But it just would be nice to talk to the person that I've been listening to forever. I know there was mention of, you know, hopefully meeting each other at a convention at Heroes Con or elsewhere. So, so that's something on my uh, wish list, I guess you could say. The other thing I talked about, because the Daily Rios episode one came out in 2012, the first year of the New 52, DC New 52, was underway. And as of this moment, we are 10 years away from Flashpoint, the New Justice League, and eventually the New 52. And I've been thinking about this for a while, that I would love to... It's crazy that it's been 10 years, first of all. Because way back then, I had in my notes, you know, I should go through month by month and look at the New 52 and how it developed and what changes they made. Now here I am 10 years later wanting to do the same thing. So you might be getting some deep dives into the New 52. I have a lot of those comics in my collection unread. So it'd be kind of nice to go through that. One of the other things that I teased was an, was an 80s comic book podcast. Still would love to do that. Um, but I'm actually finding ways to do that without becoming without it becoming its own thing. Whether it's I'm looking at individual, you know, just little miniseries here and there, or um, some topics that I might want to cover later. I'm very curious to, I don't know why, but I kind of want to dip into the new universe, which came out in 1986, 35 years ago, right? I actually would like to do a deeper dive into 1986, as well as uh, the months leading up to it at the end of 1985 to see how, you know, the comic industry changed. Um, I think we label 1986 as a great year, but, but as I do more and more research, I think you really need to go to like 1985, maybe like the middle of 1985 through to the middle of 1987. Like that's, that's the true big change 1986 just gets the crown because of whatever reason you know um but i think it also i think you need to include include the build-up and and the spillover um one of the things i am definitely going to do <laughs> that i talked about in that first episode and never did uh it was supposed to be a tumblr thing but 50 trades of rios kind of like 50 shades of gray 50 trades of rios starting with why the last man volume one and just reading 50 trades in my collection that I hadn't, haven't ever read before. And I'm like, yep, I need to do that. But I guess near the end, I was talking about, uh, you know, who were the listeners? You know, were they coming to the Daily Reels because they were CGS listeners? And it made me think, are there any listeners who are totally new to the Daily Reels um, and started listening, not not this year, but any year, like from the beginning or near the beginning, who weren't CGS listeners? Like, did they randomly just find the Daily Rios or maybe someone retweeted one of my tweets on Twitter and they were like, sure, I'll give that a try. So I'd, I'd be curious who out there is totally new to my my style of podcasting because your first episode was the Daily Rios. There you go. That's your Throwback Thursday segment. I am definitely going to follow up on all this, and I look forward to listening to more episodes to see what other ideas I can come up with. Feedback Friday. Last segment of the week, Feedback Friday, taking a look at some comments that were left on the website. Uh, Mike Atchison called the Digest a potpourri of comic-related goodness. Awesome. So uh, Mike left some comments on the second Digest from July 17th. The comments about Dave Cockrum and Nightcrawler reminded me of the fascinating history of Cockrum's influence on the industry, including his proposal to add Nightcrawler to the Legion of Superheroes universe as part of a group called the Outsiders. And even before that, 
his conception of a Nightcrawler character as a sidekick to a hero called the Intruder. And then Mike's uh, attached a link to the Legion of Superbloggers detailing the origins and creation of Nightcrawler and Storm, how they started out in the Legion universe, eventually wound up in the X-Men universe. Um, and then Mike also noted that there were a lot of characteristics and personality traits for Nightcrawler, such as baying at the moon and hissing his S consonants. And all of this was coming out because I kept seeing references in Giant Size uh, about Nightcrawler's voice, you know, cackling and laughing and howling. And I don't know if we've ever really seen that um, played out, especially in the movies, that he, he sure, he looks like a demon with a tail and three fingers, but um, that characteristic, I don't know if um, that animalistic nature, I don't know if that's been presented. Now, I had read a lot about the origins of Nightcrawler and Storm's design being an amalgamation of a bunch of, a bunch of characters. I did not know about Nightcrawler's uh, sidekick stint to a hero called the intruder like that's a new part so as i was reading that for the super bloggers on the super blogger site that was really cool so thanks mike for filling in some of that gap ben lyons on the same digest said love the segment on phil jimenez he's one of my all-time favorites his run on the invisibles is what pushed the series from great to legendary and it made me think yeah you know i think that's how i got into invisibles as well because I found out that Jimenez was going to be on that second volume. So I had to pick it up. And because I picked it up, I then would go search out for Invisibles Volume 1. Both Invisibles Volume 2 and Morrison's JLA were hitting at the same time. So I think, I think that was what kickstarted my love of Morrison. Uh, because I you know, his Animal Man run, I knew about it, but I didn't read at the time. I don't think I read, like, Doom Patrol. I I don't know. I think Arkham Asylum was, like, the only thing that I read that was close to when it was released. But I, I'll have to go back and see. I'll have to go back and see how my Morrison obsession, if you want to call it, how that started. And, you know, Ben's comment made me think, hey... Uh, this is something that's been in my notes for a while, and I'm just going to say it out here because maybe somebody will be interested. If you, like me, really dig Morrison's work, and you're somebody that can deep dive, not just like book report style, but can make connections, I really would love to do a Super Gods book club. I would love to take the novel or the, the, the book that Morrison wrote read it chapter by chapter and do episodes uh, for each chapter and get like a panel discussion of just a few people each chapter maybe it's maybe one of the chapters talks about you know the doom patrol and you really love the doom patrol so and you've read that and you understand it and you are making connections to the larger morrison oeuvre um and you want to be part of that chapter great let me know I would love to get people like Julian Lytle and David D, maybe even Jeff Clock, um, people who can see larger themes and, and really have a, a broad discussion. So I'm just throwing it out there. Usually I don't put out my topics like this because I like to curate who's on an episode, you know, and I like to mix it up a little bit. But um, yeah, I think I want to do, it's not going to be for a while though, because I want to read more of Morrison's early works. I'm talking really his, his real early works, like pre-American comics, before I get into uh, Super Gods. But um, that's something, you know, again, to use the Zoom technology, I think it'd be a lot of fun instead of doing the whole book chapter by chapter. So if that's something you're interested in, bring your A game, bring your A game though. <laughs> um, I don't, like I said, I don't like book report podcasting. I like uh, in-depth conversations. So uh, yeah, so Ben's comment really um, uh, kicked that off. And by the way, you're going to hear Ben on an upcoming episode, uh, I think uh, in the next two weeks. 
And then Ed Moore talked about uh, or made a comment about my conversation on Full Bloom, the HBO competition show, and said that there's a topiary horticulture competition show with Martha Stewart as a judge called Clipped, and that's on HGTV. And Discovery Network aired back in May or June of 2021. There's also the Big Flower Fight, which is a British television competition program. Only eight episodes, and that's on Netflix. Then I got a comment from Eric, Eric uh, from the Longbox Review Podcast on the first digest. Eric says, Curse you, Rios. I was blissfully ignoring yet another vampire comic book, but you made me interested in Philadelphia, the first two volumes of which are now on my in-stock trades list. Getting people to spend money, that's my superpower. I love it. By the way, Eric and I will have the next Legion Project episode. Should be out next week, I believe. That'll be Legion Project episode 30. Taking a look at issue 30. We're getting so close to the Universal Project. Also, go check out DC All-Stars podcast. Uh, where where Daryl Taylor and I go through the DC Universe digital series, Let Them Live, Unpublished Tales from the DC Vault. Six stories with an ambush bug framing sequence, comics that hadn't been released before. And, uh, you know, you might be surprised what you hear in that conversation. And finally... If you are a CGS listener, or maybe you are a lapsed CGS listener, go check the feed out Uh, sometime this weekend. You might get a little surprise episode with two hosts talking about a whole bunch of topics. So look for that sometime over this weekend. This has been the third Daily Rios Digest. This is The Daily Rios, episode 510 for Sunday, July 25th, 2021. Talk to you soon.